to live in a world of chaos, don't we? And it's wonderful that we serve a God that is not chaotic. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for this special gathering. We just thank you for each family uh, here and every person uh, representing businesses and home. Father, we're just thankful that uh, you are a sovereign God. And although this world seems to be falling apart, upside down, and out of control, we can give you thanks. And we can put our trust in you as a sovereign God. Father, we're also mindful of the slain officers recently. We just ask for your special extra measure of comfort and care for their families as they suffer the day today and the days ahead. And Father, we thank you for Mr. Watson being here for us, uh, with us. We just ask for a special blessing on him and his family as he brings us words of encouragement. And then, Father, we also give you thanks for this, this food we've had, uh, the bounty and the land that you've given us. You've blessed us beyond measure. We just thank you for this wonderful meal we've had and bless our time this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. I ask you to stand at this time for the pleasure of the I want to take this opportunity to welcome some of our special guests. This might say that we're all special. But we've got something a little bit more special, I guess. Um, representative, uh, representing uh, Senator Moran, uh, Bill Mays. I don't know if Bill's here. I guess. There he is back there. Welcome. Representative Blaine Finch. And I believe Blaine's in the back. City manager, and you've been recognized him. He has the crutches. <laughs> uh, Mayor Pro Tem, out of the Mayor Pro Tem, Linda Reed. <laughs> City commissioners, uh, Emily Graves, Blake Gergeson, Mike Skidmore. I don't think I saw Blake. <clears throat> County administrator, John Holmes. County Commissioners Roy Dunn, Rick Howard, and Randy Renault. Franklin County Sheriff Jeff, Jeff Richards. We don't have him down here, we're going to add him. Uh, uh, Chief of Police Dennis Butler. USD 90 Superintendent Dr. Gene Stroke. And I believe we have a number of other school board members here. Uh, if you're here, as you raise your hands. <coughs> Any other superintendents that are here? Okay. And with that, I guess we turn it over to John. <coughs> Well, good morning, everybody. Is that better on the microphone? Can you hear me at the back of the room? Really appreciate the work Richard Jackson does with the Legislative Action Committee. And you can see his committee uh, that's listed in the program, but uh, they do a good job in keeping our community informed of legislative issues and uh, uh, also candidates that are uh, running for our elected offices. Uh, I'll, I'll just stay at the beginning and I'll remind you at the end that on July 27th the committee is hosting a meet the candidates night at the Copper Center uh, for any candidate that is running to have it will be informal conversation it won't be the uh, back and forth questions like we've had before because we don't have a lot of primary races uh, in our county this year so we'll probably do a more formal uh, forum at the general election but uh, this week this this term of the election on July 27th, we're going to have a meet and greet, so I encourage you all to come to that. Um, I uh, have the unique privilege of introducing our speaker this morning, and I'm going to go through his formal introduction. Uh, Dr. Randy Watson began, began serving as Kansas Commissioner of Education in July after being named to the position by the Kansas State Board of Education in November of 2014. During his 34 years in education, Randy has been a classroom teacher in the high school and at the university levels, and as an administrator at the building and district levels. Most recently, he served for 10 years as superintendent at McPherson Public Schools, USD 418. Randy holds a bachelor's degree in history, a master of science degree in secondary administration, staff supervision, and staff development and building level certification 
and a doctorate of education in secondary administration, school law, curriculum development, and instructional leadership and district level certification. As the ch state's chief education officer, Randy provides leadership to the Kansas State Department of Education in carrying out the policies and programs prescribed by the Kansas State Board of Education and in ensuring that oversight and support is provided to assist Kansas schools, educators, and students in achieving their goals. But now, anecdotally, I'd like to, like to add a few things. I first had the opportunity to meet Randy Watson uh, in 1999 when we went through Leadership Kansas together, and we were just kind of discussing that summer where we had the opportunity to travel across different Kansas communities as uh, uh, then we considered ourselves young, of course we still do actually, and we wondered when we crossed the line, because I never did see the line. <laughs> uh, but we enjoyed talking about the issues that face our state, and uh, you know, a lot of the consensus that came from that discussion that summer was that, you know, in state government we have the responsibility to provide transportation and a way to move goods and services across the state, and we have the responsibility to take care of a certain sort, a certain segment of our community that aren't going to be able to care for themselves. But most importantly, we have the challenges communities to educate our children. And even then, Dr. Watson was inspired and challenged by education, and you could tell he was going to go on to do great things, and it did not surprise me when he was named chief educator in our state. Dr. Watson was the one that taught me that there is no fear in the person. <laughs> So it's with great pleasure that I have the opportunity to introduce my friend and the Kansas Education Commissioner, Dr. Randy Watson. The sign of a good friend that doesn't tell you all the stories on those buses <laughs> traveling across Kansas that uh, we could talk about. What an honor to be with you this morning. Thanks for coming out. I want a wonderful breakfast. I want to just spend a few minutes talking about the challenges we have in front of us with education, answer your questions. Uh, but uh, I'm certainly honored honored to be here. And I don't know, I, I drove in pretty early. Uh, and uh, a sign of a, of a vibrant hospital, I guess, is when you have to park in Lawrence. So I in. Uh, that was those. Yeah, so uh, things are hopping here. Uh, that's not true of all of our rural hospitals. So uh, I know things are are uh, going um, really, really well. Um, it, it, just about a year ago, I took over this position. And I, I want to tell you uh, my thought process going into that. Uh, so I'm going to take you back to November or October of 14. Uh, John mentioned, I had this really good job in McPherson, Kansas. I'd been there, I was there a total of 22 years. Our kids were uh, not born there, but raised there. And uh, it just was a really, really good place. And uh, I thought, I'm retiring in McPherson, Kansas. And, uh, you know, go watch a few ball games, uh, support the schools, it's a great community. And here I am. Uh, so, you know, life sometimes uh, does calls you to, to do uh, certain things. And so I, you know, there's a lot of people in here that are serving on school boards and county commissions and uh, so good to see sheriff and police and representatives. And uh, I, I just <coughs> urge all of you that um, I never thought I would be in this position. I did not aspire to this position. I honestly, a year ago thought no one could do this position. I still think that. Uh, because there are huge challenges ahead of us. But I think all of us at, at some point have to be called to serve, you know, to, to a higher calling. And, and I hope that when that happens for you that you step up uh, and do that. And speaking of that, I want to, uh, maybe, there we go. I want to make sure that you know about the people that I serve uh, every day. These are the 10 members of the State Board of Education. And many people do not know who they are. And if they do know who they are, they don't know what they do. And it's unique to Kansas. So I, I wanted to spend a few moments telling you that we have an elected state board. 
That is unique. That's not true of every state. So you get the opportunity to vote. There are 10 members. Five are up for election this year. And five then are up for election in, in two years. And uh, uh, you, can, you can see uh, the, you know, the, uh, all the people. Jim McNeese is the current board chair. And Carolyn Wins Campbell is the vice chair. And they are conservative as conservative people as you would ever find, and there's some most liberal people you would ever find. And what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is a direction that they've charted in a 10-0 vote. 10-0, uh, about where Kansas should go for the future of education. And I get the opportunity to serve with them. So please get to know them. Uh, they, they really do uh, wonderful work, and I'm proud to, to serve uh, on their behalf. I always start, and Jeannie could probably give this speech, so I'm going to alter it a little bit, Jeannie, because I only have one song, you know? And, and you get bored if you're an old rock and roll singer and you only have one song, so you have to modify it a little bit. But there's certain things that are driving our work, all right? And, and this is one. We look uh, to research a lot as to what we should be doing, and there is an organization called the Georgetown Policy Institute. You can Google it. It's a nonpartisan organization, and it's an economic education organization. So they're always looking at states' economic factors and education factors and doing some predictability state by state as to what those states will need to do in order to move their economy along. That's, that's all they do. Uh, and in fact, they just released a new report about two weeks ago, and I'll, I'll reference that. But they're saying to us that here in Ottawa, the class of 2016, but we're gonna, they're gone. We can't do anything about those kids now. We're gonna focus on the class of 17 and earlier. And when those kids walk across the stage, the job market in the state of Kansas, 71% of that market, jobs in Kansas will require something beyond that at high school education. All right, something beyond the high school education. And I will tell you, I grew up in Southeast Kansas in Coffeyville, uh, four grandparents with a sixth grade education. My mother and father uh, were high school graduates. Um, I can tell the story that my, uh, my dad didn't go to college, uh, five years of college, played five years of football, uh, had to change his name the fifth year in order to continue to play at Wichita State. I learned that just before his death. I does that, Dad. Well, if you knew my dad, you'd understand why. And then he hitchhiked home because his dad wouldn't come get him because he had a total, after five years of college, of 14 credits. I think all those were in PE, too. I had way to in PE. So he was proud. He'd sit on the porch in Coffeyville and say, hey, I didn't go to college, Randy. I turned out just fine. And those of you that might know my dad, we could debate that turned out just fine for a long time. But the truth is, he was a Brayman Switchman on Missouri Pacific Railroad. Spent his life on Missouri Pacific Railroad. And if we left here today and got stopped by a train and just watched the train go by, you could visually see that the job that my dad had that paid him upper $80,000 when he worked on the extra board is no longer in existence he spent his life on a caboose and the caboose is gone it's all automated he jumped off the track swung, swung a lantern switched the track and rode to the next town and uh, that job is not available to any of the kids in Ottawa that will graduate high school this year it was a great paying job my, my grandmother had a sixth grade education when she retired in 1985 she was the hospital dietitian at Coffeville Memorial Hospital all right. So, what, what's the what's the requirement to be the head of the dietary uh, uh, services here in Ottawa? What's the entry requirement? Because I can tell you what it is in Coffin Hospital now. A master's level. Of yeah, yeah. It's a master's level in dietary management and nutrition. My grandmother had a sixth grade education. Was the head of that department in 1985 which is just a couple of days ago, John. You know? <laughs> and you know how she got the job? She started working and putting food on trays. They liked her work and they made her assistant cook. And then they made her, you know, head cook and then assistant director. 
And I only tell you that because sometimes we think that the era of which we grew up is the era of which our kids are going to live. And it's simply not the case. So I'm not here to tell you that a kid that drops out of high school or a kid that only graduates high school is not going to be successful. Because there's a, there's a chance that they will be. But if you're going to Vegas, don't bet on those odds. That, that's all I'm telling you. To tilt the odds, we'd like to, for them to have some education past high school. And I, Now, I say that. Now let me tell you what we've done, I think, an injustice all across Kansas, and it's not intentional, but we, what we've done is said for, I call it the post-World War II generation, and certainly my grandparents and my parents said, you know, we didn't go to college, but Randy, it would be great if you could go be a teacher. That's an honorable profession, so it's, it's a good living, you get to give back to others, and we have pushed a great majority of kids toward a four-year education a baccalaureate, master's, or PhD. And we only need about 35% of our workforce to have that level of, of degree. Now we need engineers, we need uh, doctors, right? We need lawyers, so I'm not discouraging that. But when you look at a graduation class across Kansas of let's say 100 kids, and our high school graduation to graduate from Ottawa, or from, graduate from Coffeyville or Topeka Seaman is four years of English, three years of math, three years of social studies, uh, three years of science, a unit of fine arts, a unit of PE, and some electives totaling 21 to 29. That's, that is the requirements to go to a four-year university in Kansas. And those are the default requirements in almost every one of our high schools. So what I'm going to ask you as we go through this morning is to think about this young men and women that go on to be an electrician, physical therapy assistant, a radiology tech, I'll come back to that one here in a second, uh, a welder, a plumber, uh, an app developer. They deserve our honor and our recognition just as much as the kid that's going to go to KU to major in pre-pharmacy. And Kansans, what I'm going to tell you in a minute, said we're not honoring those kids enough. We're treating them like second class citizens. And it needs to stop. Because all of those are <coughs> valuable to the economy and they're, and they're really good paying jobs. And in many cases, they out earn their baccalaureate, master's, and PhD. I said about radiology tech. In Kansas, a radiology tech, six years out of that to your program, average is $52,000 in Kansas. A four-year radiology technician, four-year degree in Kansas, average $53,000. Which one do you think has more debt? Have you checked out the cost of college lately? Now, I went to Kansas State 19, in the late 70s. I had a little bit of scholarship, worked a part-time job, and left without any debt. That is not true coming out of Kansas colleges today, the average debt's $23,000. <clears> and I will tell you, in every one of our communities, we send, this will be true of the class of 16 here in Ottawa, we send kids off, and by Christmas they'll be back home. Not because they're not capable, because they don't know what they want to do, and they, here's the, here's the code, here's the code. Ask any child in class of 17, or 18, or 19, what do you want to do, and if the answer is this, I'm going to college. You know they don't know what they want to do yet. That is code for, that's what I've been told to say. I'm going to college. And we just need to, we just need to talk about that and fo focus on that. So we've got to do better at helping every kid find what their passion is and how we're going to go about doing that. So John mentioned, I, I agreed to take the job in November of 14. I was Superintendent McPherson and I asked them, if I could wait and come on board in July of 15 uh, because I needed to finish out that school year. So I had a lot of vacation time build up and I took it uh, and decided to tour the state with Brad Nunswander and we were going to find out what Kansans wanted in a new education system. Amazing, right? We go ask Kansans what they want. That's what we did. And we went to 20 
different sites across Kansas. And we simply asked three questions. What is a successful 24-year-old in Kansas? What does that person look like? If you were to imagine success in a young person in Kansas, how would you describe that person? And we heard some great things. So we wanted to be happy and successful and not living in my basement. And you know all of these things about what people want success. And then we simply ask a second question. All right, if that's what we think is success, then what is K-12's role, if any, in developing that person? And then what is higher ed's role, if any, in developing that person? Those are the three questions. And I wanted to share with you what over 2,000 Kansans told us. They said, 23% of the responses said, they better have some academic skills. They better, have, they better know how to do some things. Uh, it's important to do that. 70% though of those responses about what makes up successful people were non-academic in nature. They have character. They show up to work on time. They're persistent. They set goals. They give back to their community. A lot of what we call conscientiousness skills. 70% of responses of over 2,000 Kansans told us that. 3% said you have to be healthy, mentally, physically. Again, 2% said employed. Just please have our kids employed. Having a 28-year-old and 22-year-old, I can verify that's an important goal, right in life, is when uh, they're, they're employed. And 2% said some kind of credential. But the vast majority of responses were of the non-academic skills. But what we noticed, and we, we came to groups like this, is that we did not have very much business participation. There are a lot of parents, there are a lot of educators, there are a lot of higher ed, but we didn't have a great deal of business participation. So I called Mike O'Neill, the Kansas Chamber, and I said, we'd like to go back out. Brad and I would like to go back out. And we would like to, to work with the local chambers of commerce, like here, and we'd like to come out and talk to business leaders in, in the community. So we went back out on the road to seven different communities. And I gotta tell you a little story. We were in Kansas City on this first tour, and the TV station, I don't remember which one came up and said, well, we understand that you're going to Oakley and uh, Sublette and Dodge and, you know, Coffeyville. Why would you do that? And I looked at her, you know, nice young lady. I said, where do you, where, where do you come from? And she said, what do you mean? I said, where did you grow up? New York. I said, well, this is Kansas and this is what we do. We go out and talk to people and find out. And so what, we went back out and asked business the exact same questions. Business leaders from, uh, from as large as Spirit, Hallmark, to mom and pop shops, all right? Business leaders, seven different communities throughout the state asking the same question, and this is what they told us. I was studying in Lawrence, in fact, with the, with the head of a construction company, and he said, Randy, let me tell you, I just hired two young people, $20 an hour to start on our construction crew on Monday, and this was in the middle of the week. He said, on Monday morning, you know, we're at 8 o'clock, they're not here. And one shows up at 8.24, one shows up at 8.30. I said, gentlemen, we got to get on the truck, we got to get out to the work site, we got work to do. And he said, I was fuming. You know, I just hired these guys, I'm paying them 20 bucks an hour. We get on the work site, he said, within a half hour, one of them's on their cell phone texting. And he said, at the end of the day, one of the two of them, came up and said, now how do you get promoted in this company? <laughs> and he said, they don't have a work ethic. They don't even know what it means to give me a good day's work. I'm paying them a good wage. It's not their academic skills, it's that they don't know what it is to work. And we could spend a whole day talking about the issues uh, of why that is. But I will tell you that um, you can see that if you simply go to a couple places, go to any of your favorite fast food places tonight at 6 o'clock and uh, count the number of adults working versus the number of kids. Because if you had to come to Coffeeville in the 70s at 6 o'clock at night, 
We were all 14 and 15 year old kids, frying burgers, car hopping. We were just trying, we were earning a part time living. Go today and you'll find in fast food today in Kansas, that ratio is five to one, adult to kid. I had a paper route. I had a paper route. You know the Stingray bike? You, got, you guys, you envision it, right? Get up early, paper route. Well, I still take, in McPherson, we still have a home there, take two daily papers. Salina Journal and the McPherson Sentinel. The Salina Journal is delivered to me via car at about 5.30 in the morning by a 50-year-old gentleman. And at night, a 50-year-old gentleman on a bike delivers the McPherson Sentinel, not a kid. So what once was almost entirely a kid market has been taken up some by adults. So we've got to work on what does it take to be employable? What's it take to, to have those skills that are going to um, do that work? So we took all of this information, the largest qualitative study ever done in Kansas. Kansas State University helped us with the analysis of this. And the state board that I just mentioned earlier said, we're going to raise the bar beyond anything anyone's ever seen. We're going to lead the world. Now, I kid my, my uh, counterparts in Nebraska, Oklahoma, Missouri. Uh, I love Joy in Oklahoma. I say, you know, Joy, we don't care about you. We're going, you know, we can already whip Oklahoma. This is not, not a big deal. We're going straight to Finland and Singapore. We're going to annihilate them. And the success of each student, the success. Now, I want to ask you, how many of you in your own family have more than one child? Raise your hand. Have you ever, across the table from your spouse, but maybe over dinner, looked at him and said, where did this one come from? <laughs> right? Because you think, hey, okay, we weren't very smart on the first one, right? We were making it up, you know, no, there's no point. But by the time the second or third, we kind of, you know, where, what happened? We were getting better. And think about that in an elementary classroom of 25 kids, or a middle school of 400 or 500 kids. Every kid is different. And we, we have a system called school that is highly successful for somewhere between 70 and 90% of our kids, depending on the level of poverty. It's extremely successful. But what we have to acknowledge, just like when you work with your own kids, you know, I have, I have a 28-year-old daughter who the older she gets, I find out she's very adverse to change. I, what is she? She's an elementary art teacher. Well, we're, we're teachers in our family. She coaches volleyball. Well, she played volleyball. She lives 60 miles from home in Great Bend, from, from where she grew up in McPherson. And I think that's what her life will be. Nothing wrong with that. Perfectly fine, but it's very, it's very kind of tightly controlled. My son, who's on the autism spectrum, all right, comes to us. It says, hey, mom and dad, I got an idea. I think I want to be an animator. What? I get a real job. What, what is an animator? Where do you do that? In, you don't do that in Kansas. You can't, you can't do that in Kansas. He says, I know. I want to go to Savannah. That's in Georgia. And go to school. Well, here's the deal. My son would come home after school and go to his room. He never went to prom. I couldn't even get him to go to a ball game. Why? Because he didn't socially want to do that. That was his disability. He didn't, he didn't care to socialize. And now he tells us he's going to Savannah, Georgia. And Debbie, his mother, and I looked at each other and said, there's no chance that this will be successful. There's just no chance. Change is hard on him. There's no way. Four years, last year, he graduated with honors from Savannah College of Art and Design. And if you're into crazy adult animation, there's a, there's a uh, cable channel that I refuse to watch, FX. And he is uh, right now just finished a, a pilot series that will air in September for FX. Right? Makes more money than his sister as a teacher. All right? So what I'm saying is we have to look at each child and we have to maximize their success. And here's what, how we have to do it. We have to sit down with families and kids and try to figure out this puzzle called life, right? What are they interested in? What's their passion? How can we help move them to what they want to do? And whatever they want to do, show them 
the positives and the negatives of that field or that career and help them move toward that. Do you want to be a diesel mechanic? Go be a diesel mechanic. It's, a, it's an honorable job. You know, I, I was with a group of people, we were working on career in tech yet, we were having this discussion. And I will tell you, this is exactly the problem we have in Kansas. And a lady, this is a, in a group of people talking about the career exploration of every kid. And the lady stood up and said, you're right, Randy, I tell my children all the time, you do not want a job with your name on your shirt. <laughs> well, there were four people with their names on their shirts in the audience. Very successful. You know, the fire chief, and we had an electrician, and of course she tried to back off of that statement. That is the mentality too many of us have about what the honor of you know, work is and, and uh, should be. I, I have a, a doctorate in education, but at 4th of July weekend, my air conditioning stops working. And I noticed that my wife thinks I keep it about sub-zero in the house. So she was like, I think it feels pretty nice. Well, it's, you know, it's about 85. And so, you know, what I do, I go downstairs, mm, the thing's humming. I check the filter, I check the breaker, looks good. I go outside, it's, it's circulating, looks good. Come back in, it's temperature's going up. So uh, I clean, I clean the outside unit, thinking maybe that's it. Nothing, it's still going up. So I call my friend at McPherson, had their kids in school, my local HVAC person, and his wife answers the phone. It's the Fourth of July weekend, and I explain my dilemma, and I can hear her yelling, "Hey, John, it's Randy. His air conditioning is not working, and he wants us. He wants you to come over and fix it." This is going to cost him a lot of money. <laughs> That's exactly what you, and it did. So he came out. He came out, and the fireworks were going off in the neighborhood. And it was a it was a little fuse in the unit that shorted a, a, a little wire. He fixed it. You know, three hundred and fifty dollars later, it's cooling my house. But I want you to think about this. At that moment, on July fourth, two thousand fifteen. Who's the smartest person in the room? Me or him? Him. It's not about this prestige that uh, someone that goes and becomes a lawyer is smarter than someone who goes and becomes an app developer. It's just a different, different type of, uh, of, of thing that we're looking for. So the success of each child. <coughs> Academic skills are important, but so are some others. So here's our definition of a successful high school graduate. You'll see five areas. Academic preparation, that can be measured on a test. Yes, you have to study, be able to read and, uh, and write. Cognitive preparation, that's a little different. That's can you think and problem solve. So I'll ask you this, have you ever known someone that had a lot of degrees, they were really smart, and yet they get lost in town every every day. They can't they can't find their way, right? They just don't seem to have any common sense. So how's that cognitive preparation of problem solving? Technical skill. Can you use a tape measure? Can you can you uh, uh, can you count by change? I'll go back to the Sonic driving by the way. We have a Sonic in the Ooh, ooh, it's it's two. Two to four, it's happy hour, it's on. I know this, about half price drinks. And, and show up today, half price drinks, we went for the Sonic, and whatever your bill is, $6.13, give them $10.48 and watch the fun begin. Because they actually count back change on the fly. The only place I know, Sonic, the rest of them just read the cash register and so if you only want to know if kids can count back change or adults can count back change, go to the Sonic and, and mess with them a little bit. <laughs> Employability skills, show up to work. A year ago, this year, there was a wonderful article in Sports Illustrated about a young man from Kansas named Jordy Nelson. You may have heard of him. He catches footballs for the Green Bay Packers. And he grew up in Raleigh County. And the article was about a a receiver for the Green Bay Packers that base salary is $14 million a year before bonuses. And the article was about what? Did you read it? It's about what Jordy did every summer, which was what? Came back to Raleigh County and worked on the farm. 
And the, and the and the author, the writer of the article, couldn't believe why someone making fourteen million dollars would do that. And you know Jordy's answer. That's what our family does. My brother and I come back and we help with harvest every year. Not because I have to, it's what our family does. Work ethic, right? A work ethic of what that should look like. Oh, we crashed. Um, and then civic engagement. Kansan said, we have to have people, many of you here, that give back to their communities and serve others. And by serving others in some way, you determine that, you'll, get, you'll reap rewards from that. Whether it's a blood drive, to serving on a city or you know a, a county commission, to helping you know with uh, with voting, to there's all kinds school boards that pays really well. Doesn't it? school boards? Yeah. yeah. Jeannie will break out some peanuts every now and then. That's something we call that. So how we engage kids in civic engagement? I will tell you that I think this generation gets that a little bit better than mine do. They're a little bit more civic-minded, I think, in helping people uh, than, than maybe my generation. How do we do that? So that they're successful in post-secondary education, entertainment industry, recognized certificate, or in the workforce without the need for remediation. And here are the five outcomes the state board's using to measure. One, kindergarten readiness. The biggest gap that we have here in Ottawa that we have here in Lawrence, that we have uh, in uh, Chinook, doesn't matter where we go. The biggest gap, academically, emotionally, and behaviorally, happens day one of kindergarten. That's in our K-12 system. The largest gap is the time they enter kindergarten. We will have kids this fall, here in Ottawa, that will show up kindergarten reading at second or third grade level. No doubt about it. We'll have kids that show up, know all their colors, can count over 100, can tell you about the experiences that they have, love to play with other kids. And we have kids that will show up here in Ottawa that will not know how to spell their own name, cannot tell you where they live, much less know any member, any part of the alphabet. Blue looks like orange in terms of what they will say. And that gap then we try to narrow, we try to catch those kids up. But kindergarten readiness is really important. And it's a community expectation. Because here's what we would love to have. Every parent bring their kid ready for kindergarten. That's, that's, that's our aspirational goal. Every parent bring their kid ready for kindergarten. The second question though we have to ask is, what happens when it doesn't occur? And that's a community function. You know, I uh, just was working with some people uh, in a Lutheran community, and they said, you know, most of our kids go to a Lutheran preschool. Wonderful. Faith-based preschools are great. So you work with your community on your strengths and where you can help bring kids kindergarten ready. Maybe it's simply that that's already happening here in Ottawa because parents are taking that responsibility. Or how can we help parents with that responsibility? Second, individual plan of study. I mentioned that earlier. How can we help every kid find their passion? Going to college is not a career exploration. It's not, it can't be. It's too expensive. So, you know, in my generation, I think everything kind of boils down to an animal house quote. You know, so if, you, if you're in that generation, you'll appreciate, right? When, when Dean Farber saying, son, fat, fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life. And he's uh, you know, acknowledging John Belushi and the others. Uh, because you remember that they've gone to college and had a zero GPA. Uh, we have to help kids focus on what they want to do. And I'm just, you know, so if we have a sophomore here at Ottawa High School, two sophomores, maybe they're twins, and one says, I really think I want to be in the medical field. Don't know what, but I think I want to be a doctor or a pharmacist. I want to do something in, in the medical field. And another one who says, I'm pretty locked in on, on auto tech. You know, I really like to work with cars. I really want to, want to do that. Should their plan of study be the same? Because it is today. At least in the core areas. Both those kids will study Shakespeare. I just was out in a very small community in Kansas where a young man was failing. He's a sophomore. Early in the year, he was failing both 
or everything. He felt everything as a freshman, everything as a sophomore. His dad was on the school board. This is not a good combination. <laughs> and dad says, my dad and my grandfather farmed this county. In fact, they owned, they, they owned the county. They were the largest farming operation, ranching operation. And I'm not giving, he says this in the meeting, I'm not giving it to that kid unless he graduates high school. And so we ended up having a 30 minute discussion with this young man. And I, a, long, a couple questions I asked. I said, tell me what you dislike the most. English. Of all of them, English. What do you like to do? So, and dad interrupted and said, he's lazy. He, 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 want, he can do the work, he won't do the work. I, yeah, I get it, Dad. Dad, is there anything he's not lazy? Yeah, pick it up at, before dawn and help with chores around the house and on the farm. What does he like to do? He loves to be out on the farm. He loves to be with the cow. He loves to be, you know, uh, out in the pasture. I'm listening. Because those are giving me clues of what he loves to do. So we decided in this very, very small school, the faculty would, would fit on one table here. It tells you how small the school is. Plus 100 kids, K-12. So it's a very small school. They were agreeable to blow it up. We blew his entire schedule up and made it all about farming. He had to present to, to organizations like this his plan for taking over the family farm when he does. He had to, he had to, he had to calculate, am I going to put more into pasture? Am I going to put more into cattle? Am I going to put more into cropland? Because they own a, a lot of, of acres. And when I checked in April, but this year, he was making all A's and B's. Because we found what interested him, which wasn't studied, something he could see no interest when he wanted to go back and own that farm that his dad, grandparents, and great-grandparents had done. That's important. High school graduation rate. This statistic scares me to death, and I verified it a couple of times. If you do not graduate high school in Kansas today, you have a slim chance of ever living in the middle class, ever in your lifetime, if you drop out of high school. Now, there's an old Jim Carrey movie, and I don't remember, I don't remember what the, what, which one it was, but when, it, when he was presented with a very slim chance, and he said, so I've got one, I've got a chance. <laughs> yes, you've got a chance. But the odds of you being Bill Gates are not very likely All right, in this. Kansas graduates 86% of their, uh, their young people in four years. That's one of the best in the country. In fact, we're number two in the country of students with disability, and yet that's not good enough. We need every kid to graduate from high school with some skill sets. This comes to the next and post-secondary completion. Find out what they want to do and help them get there. Um, the military, great option. Great option for kids. Uh, but you know what, the number one reason most high school kids don't make it through military? You know the reason? The enlisted part. They're, not, they're physically unfit. They can't, they can't make it through basic training. So again, if you have a junior here in Ottawa, says, I think I want to be in the Marines. You know, the kid's 5'8", 240. Guess what that individual plan gets to be? We'll see you at 6 in the morning. we got a little physical activity we got to get to. Because he'll never make it. Never make it. That's, that's the goal. And finally, social and emotional growth. We are seeing more and more students come to school uh, with a lot of baggage. And I was just with a, a, a teacher at Blue Valley a few weeks ago. And she's saying, I got 25 kids and they want me to have all these test data. And last night, this, this young kid's dad beat mom and put mom in the hospital and dad's in jail and he's on his way to prison. And, and she's just walking. I walked into the room. This was a little breakout session. And then she looks at me and goes, and you, you make me take state assessments. And this, oh, wow, someone had too much caffeine this morning. Right? <laughs> so I just said to her, all right, if you were in charge of your school and your classroom tomorrow, what would you do? And she said, well, I would, I, well, I got to get the social worker and the counselor together because this young kid's going to go home and there's no mom. Mom's in the hospital. There's no extended family. Dad's in jail. Kid's shut down. He's acting out. I can't teach him reading today. He's, he's lost. And you know what my answer was? Go do it. If that's what that kid needs tomorrow to be successful the next day, we've got to take those steps. 
if it's I don't have the academic skills to go become a veterinarian, maybe I have to start ramping up and doubling up. What does it take to make every student successful? So that's what we're looking at. I want to uh, end by just telling you that this is our moonshot. This is not an easy thing. This is the redesign of Kansas education. You know, John Kennedy in, in the early 60s, when we couldn't fire a rocket into space, those of you who are old enough to remember how scared we were when Sputnik went up, and we couldn't do it. And he said at Rice University, we, we accept that challenge because it's one we're, we're willing to accept, one we're unwilling to postpone, and that we intend to win. And in 1969, I remember sitting around with the family on the snowy TV watching Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon because we were challenged to do so. So the challenge today is how do we help every kid and every family be successful in our schools and how do we do it facing, you know, uh, uncertainty about funding. But, but we've got to get after it, we've got to do it. I want to share with you a short video and then answer any questions that you might have. That's loud. <laughs> Maybe not, the stuttering version of the... Uh, <laughs> what's the day? That will make us smile. That was a nice wheat field. We're just like, <laughs> we're trying to run it off of a zip drive, so that's why it's <clears throat> chunking it over. So, I'm very proud, as I said, to be here with you. And uh, Jeannie and, and staff here at Ottawa and the community are deeply uh, engaged in in this work. This will not be easy. This will not happen overnight. You know, we, we've got some important work to do to help every kid be successful. An engineer recently said to me, you know, if you want to go 50 miles on a gallon of gas, we get in a room, we start redesigning the car and the engine. But if the challenge is you got to go 500 miles on a gallon of gas, you start all over because it can't get there on the old model. And that's where we're going to have to be. We're going to have to challenge our existing models so that every kid is successful. So thank you, John, for having me.